welcome back to Irish American Magazine. I'm Tom Degnan. My guest today has truly earned the hyphen in Irish American. He is Des Bishop, popular comedian, performer, and TV personality on both sides of the Atlantic. He is taking part in the 2022 Origin First Irish Festival. He's got the U.S. premiere of a new show he's written that he's going to be performing uh, this month. Uh, around New York City in several of the boroughs. He's here to talk about it. Uh, Des Bishop, welcome to Irish America Magazine. Oh, thanks. Great great to be back. Uh, Des, uh, we've been doing these. We would meet up in person, of course, if this was pre-times. We've been doing these Zoom interviews since COVID has hit. Um, a couple of months back, it seemed like we were going to emerge from that, and I was going to be able to stop asking this question, but I can't. I have to ask this question. How is everyone on your end doing in terms of COVID? Oh, I mean, everybody, everybody on my end is fine. Uh, <laughs> coincidentally enough, the show that I'm doing is about my mother who died in 2019. So I don't have any, I don't have parents to worry about throughout this uh, COVID, but even in the, this latest wave, uh, everybody's fine. I mean, my, my brother had it and everything, but, but, uh, but everybody's fine. But, you know, we, we might not have been having this conversation if it wasn't for this particular round of, Omicron because it's directly related to uh, why I'm doing these shows with the Origin Theater Festival. So, so let's start there. I mean, we're going to talk about your long career. Uh, I sort of uh, jokingly referred to it, but you, 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 you have a truly unique perspective on both the Irish and the American experience, and you have for a long time. Uh, we'll talk about that, but but let's start with that. Tell us about this show, Mia Mama. Correct. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, me and Mama just means my mom. It, everybody still says Mama Mia, but that's fine. That's kind of that was that was the the joke behind it. I was just looking for a show that made people know it was about my mother. But you know, she, she died in uh, 2019, and I sort of accidentally ended up jo like uh, talking about it because I immediately afterwards had a comedy festival in Australia. So once this kind of material about you know death and motherhood and you know the type of woman that my mother was. Uh, started to happen in a bit of a raw way, I decided to commit to doing like a, a proper show about, uh, you know, my mother and all that stuff. And uh, I was I was actually tour, I was touring it in Ireland, uh, you know, and it, it stopped because of the, it because of the, the pandemic. Uh, so I was laughing to myself in the, the intro, you were like, uh, he has a new show. <laughs> it's like, this damn show has been around for so long, but I just haven't been able to actually do it for so long that this is only performance wise, I'm heading into like only the fourth month of performing it, but actually I wrote it like well over two years ago. In other words, you've now got it down perfect. Well, actually, no, would you believe that I I ended up, I did a couple of uh, like re, re warm up shows at the Comedy Cellar uh, over the last couple of months. And then actually back in Ireland, I did two also like warm up show kind of rehearsal type shows in a venue in Cork right before Ireland started to shut down again. Uh, so now I've got it back to like pretty much where it was, but certainly not like uh, the, the, the two year gap almost made it feel like I was, I was starting over actually. Can you give us a sort of thumbnail sketch? Are we talking about a straight sort of monologue, spoken word type thing? Are we talking characters? What kind of show is this? And what do you want it to, what do you want people to walk away with knowing about your mom? Well, I mean, it, it, it's like, it's like a one man show, I guess, like a typical kind of like stand up comedian who decides to do something that has a bit more of a narrative, but it's not like, it's not characters or anything, but it's definitely not like, straight stand-up. I mean, I, I want it to, it's always funny, except that it's not afraid to, you know, not be funny at a moment where it, it shouldn't be. Uh, I mean, I, I, I would like people, I mean, in terms of like what people think about my mom leaving the show, I mean, I think they'll, you know, they'll, they'll get a kick out of the interesting character that she was, but I, I'd almost, I'd want people walking away more with thoughts about their own relationships with their mothers. And then I'd also like people to walk away uh, with their own thoughts about uh, grief, particularly if they've lost a parent or if they've lost anybody, I'd like them to think about 
you know, the, the journey that they had and, you know, what they, uh, what they think they did right, what they think they did wrong, uh, regrets. And, uh, and then also because my mother had like a lot of anxiety and stress and uh, some of that was unique to her. I think some of that was unique to the time that we were brought up, you know, the eighties, particularly I'd like people to, you know, leave thinking about their own childhoods and the way that they were raised and what they, what they, what they're trying to do different with their own kids. Uh, what ends up being the same, you know, I, I want them to think about all that type of stuff. In case uh, people who uh, are, are tuning in and are maybe having some trouble placing the county of your accent, uh, maybe we can <laughs> spiral back a little bit. Clearly, obviously, you're, one of the great influences your mother had on you was giving you this both American and this Irish experience. So, so let's talk a little bit about your background. You were born and raised in New York, correct? Where, what part? Uh, Flushing, Queens, where, you, where I was raised, a Flushing Bayside border. And that's where your parents oh. settled? Yeah, well, you know, my mother's from New York. My mother's born in New York. And they they moved there. Her mother was from Glengarriff, West Cork. Her father's from County Down. They they moved out of Manhattan, like out of Yorkville. I guess when my mother was like five or six, you know, right after the war, I guess, and uh, grew up in you know Flushing. It was like a very sort of, I think Irish American, Italian American neighborhood. Um, went to St Andrew's Church. My dad was actually, my dad was uh, born in the UK, raised in Cork, and then. Went, went back to the UK and uh, I mean, he considered himself a cork man, but his dad was actually English, which he kind of like always tried to play down. <laughs> and uh, he, he immigrated to the United States, like, you know, the, the late sixties and uh, that my mother had a party. So my dad wasn't American, but then eventually when they had me late 1975, uh, they, settled back into Queens and originally moved in with my grandmother, but then uh, bought a house in 1978. So I ended up having the, the Queens life that, that my mother had, even though my dad had never been like uh, thinking that he would have the suburban life, which I talked about a lot in the previous show. My dad was named James Bond about my own dad sort of transition from like an actor and a model into like a suburban dad in Queens. Uh, but anyway, that, that's, how, that, that's how they ended up. The Queens thing was definitely from my mother's side. And how do you end up basically back in Ireland? Or how do you end up deciding that you're going to uh, spend significant amounts of time in Ireland? Yeah, I mean, well, I was 14 when that happened. I flunked out of St. Francis Prep in the Fresh Meadows. And this crazy idea came up to go to boarding school in Ireland, which was never a plan, never a a thought in my head until a cousin put the idea in my head that summer I was in summer school. She was helping me with my homework. She was visiting us from Waterford. She was like on a J1. And uh, she literally just put this crazy idea in my head. My parents, she knew that my mother was like thinking about where I was going to go to school that following year for my sophomore year of high school. And I just thought it was the coolest idea ever. I actually put the, the idea in my parents' head. I think they thought it was crazy at first, but actually when they looked into it, it suddenly seemed to be kind of doable from out of, out of nothing. Uh, it seemed doable. And then six weeks later, I was in Ireland. It was, uh, that was all a six week period. That was a, that was just a strange fortuitous moment. And uh, I went to boarding school, you know, I, I, I liked it straight away, but then I wasn't a hundred percent sure I wanted to stay until uh, around Easter of, of my first year. So like I was in, I was in my nearly the end of my first academic year in Ireland, I decided, you know what, actually, I'm going to finish high school here. And uh, by the time I finished high school, you know, college was so cheap in Ireland, and I was pretty settled in. So then I decided to stay for college, which was definitely not my, my parents idea. They didn't, they didn't think like, I'd never come back to New York full time again. And then when I was in college, I got into comedy, and then I just never left. Then I just basically became an Irishman with a New York accent. Um, and so, so this really wasn't sort of, I mean, obviously no one has really sort of long-term plans at 14, but even as you started thinking about, you know, as you got older, it was not necessarily like, I want to bring, it wasn't a plan. I want to bring my stuff to Ireland and get in touch with roots and, or anything along those lines. It sounds like it pretty much unfolded organically. It was totally organic. 
total. I I didn't even I didn't even know I was going to stay for college. I, I actually I went to Fordham and had like an interview with somebody. You know, like I was thinking about coming back and going to Fordham, but like I, you know, we, we there was no we didn't even have any plan for that. So none 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 of it was planned. It was you know deciding to stay for college too was also like a last minute decision, and uh, then even you know when I started doing stand-up I, I still at that stage hadn't thought like oh i'll be staying in ireland so n- none of it was like a long-term plan uh, maybe you can tell me something that i'm missing because but but i try <clears throat> i sort of rack my brain sort of thinking it's not a very common thing to have um a, an american of irish background go back to ireland um and, and spend significant amounts of time there and sort of explain one culture to the other. I think of someone like JP Donlevy, the writer, but um, did you have, did you look for models? Did you think of models or were you cool sort of just trail blazing that trail yourself? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't, th- I didn't, I didn't think of it, but then I also didn't, you know, I wasn't uh, thinking when I first went, I was so young. I wasn't, I wasn't thinking about, you know, like that this would become a thing that I would like turn into performances or anything. I mean, I was just naturally liked performing, but I wasn't thinking in those early years, like, oh, you know, I should really start to tell these stories to Irish people. And even when I got into stand up, uh, you know, I didn't have really any idea what I really wanted to talk about. Uh, it just so happened that once I started telling this kind of like, I came here and this is what I saw kind of stand up material in those early years that it really resonated with people. Cause I, you know, there just wasn't uh, in the UK. I feel that there was some, you know, some comics, particularly the comics that would come from the States and they would sort of tell British people what they were like through their eyes, but there hadn't really been anybody in Ireland. Certainly not, certainly not in stand up. There wasn't a lot of stand up comedians anyway, but, I don't know. It was pretty unique, I guess, to them. It wasn't to me. I was just telling the stories that that happened to me. But to Irish people, it was quite novel, and they def- it definitely resonated with them. Well, I'm pretty sure in the long run, I, I would be comfortable nominating you for some sort of something along the lines of a Nobel Peace Prize because you're you're <laughs> explaining you're explaining Americans to the Irish. You're explaining the Irish to Americans. Those are two very different cultures, but one thing they have in common is they're very comfortable in their ways and they're really not that interested in changing their ways, either one of them. And so here you are sort of pointing, you're able to point out the oddities of both. It's a pretty unique perspective. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the good news about Ireland is that they have a great sense of humor about themselves. And actually these days, when I go back, like particularly after the pandemic, I, well, like after this initial long stretch where I wasn't in Ireland, I went back and I was kind of giving my jokes about the pandemic that weren't specifically Irish because I was over here. <laughs> I had Irish people complaining that I, I wasn't talking about Ireland. <laughs> you know, not that the stuff I was saying wasn't funny, but they were kind of annoyed at me for not talking about Ireland. Like they, they've always been more than open to basically having me take the piss out of them. You know, I mean, of course, if you read the comments online, that wouldn't be the case, but uh, that's never the online stuff isn't isn't the truth but uh so they do have a good sense of humor about themselves so that's good but it, in terms of you know bridging the gap they don't 100 uh, percent embrace irish america as them being irish which is always like a little bit of an annoyance to me but uh but also a source of fun to be able to try to uh, have them understand particularly like if you take me and mama like the, the character that my mother is, other than her accent, she's raised by Irish people. And you know, I, I think a lot of people see themselves in the type of woman that my mother was, even though she was never raised in Ireland. She has a lot of the demons that Irish people have, you know, with the, the Catholic church and the, the cold upbringing and the booze. And, you know, so I, I think sometimes it, 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 it would surprise Irish people how similar Irish Americans are. I, I think also it surprises Irish Americans when they go to Ireland to find out how not Irish Irish they are, you know, as, it, and I include myself in that. It's like, once you live there, you realize, oh, there's just a lot of stuff that you, you just don't understand. And I mean, I, I don't know why they deny us as much as they do over there. Uh, but, uh, 
but I do understand that a lot of the stuff that Irish Americans think is Irish to Irish people isn't, you know? Yeah, we, we assume they don't have corn. They only have corned beef and cabbage maybe five days a week, I assume, right? <laughs> yeah, well, the whole thing is that they eat bacon and cabbage. They don't even understand why we say corned beef and cabbage, right. but that's just like, you know, uh, like one of the the many things. But, the, you know, that's like a whole other discussion, but I like to get into an argument about, our, you know, to Irish people about uh, Irish American, it's importance because, you know, like the diaspora, not just Irish America, but the Irish in the UK, the Irish in Australia, uh, they, they kind of make Ireland, uh, in a way, they, they're, they're part of what makes the Irish nation what it is, because it makes Ireland more important than it is, which is not an insult to Ireland, but it's like, why is this tiny island of 5 million people, uh, or 6 million with the north, right? Why is this tiny island so important internationally? And like, some of that is definitely the, the diaspora. So, it, and they know that, and, you know, in in real terms, when they're not being tongue in cheek, they, they embrace the diaspora more than they uh, they espouse publicly. Um, we are talking to Des Bishop. This is Irish America Magazine. Uh, Des and I are talking about his career as well as Mia Mama, a show he's putting on as part of the 2022 Origin First Irish Fest. Uh, Des, we've sort of alluded a lot to the coronavirus, but can you just tell us how has it affected your career? Like, what's the deal? Um, where were you when it started? Uh, how, what plans did it interrupt? Tell us just, you know, glad to hear everyone's healthy and doing as well as they can be. How has this disrupted the performances, all that stuff? Well, you know, I was in, I was into, you know, I was two months into Mia Mama, basically. I did March 6th, 7th and 8th in Cork in the Everman Theater. The corona had already started. There was actually a positive case in Cork a couple of days before I started that weekend. So uh, I was already joking about the coronavirus. And that it, it started to get bad that week. And it, that following Thursday was when they decided to shut down shows for a while. We could have never imagined it would take this long. Like I, all the shows from the weekend after those Cork dates, I still haven't done, but they still exist. A lot, most of the people held on to those tickets. So I'm doing those shows this April, hopefully. I don't know. I don't know what's happening, but uh, anyway, I'm, I'm my my stuff is live, really. You know, like like everything I most of the stuff I do is like live. Uh, I have a podcast, but none of it is important to me in terms of like my real career, other than live stuff. So really, my uh, the majority, like I'd say, eighty percent of my stuff has been dead for two years. Um, yeah, you know, I did a few online things, but I basically been waiting to finish this Mia Mama tour. Um, had I known it was going to be two years, I might have sort of like just put the Mia Mama tour in the can and just been like, when this is all over, I'll come back with something fresh. But anyway, uh, the good news is that New York has been back performing live since April. So I have been doing shows in New York, but just like I, you know, because because it was never sure exactly when Ireland was going to come back. I never really booked too much stuff in the States because I, there was always a chance that Ireland was going to come back. So right now I'm supposed to be in Ireland. Like this whole first Irish thing was a, a fortuitous uh, meeting after Ireland shut down again, basically, you know, the, Ireland now has an 8 PM curfew, 50% shows. So we postponed the January shows. So I, I just hit up uh, origin theater. Well, you know, somebody said, Oh, you should talk to them. And then it turned out that the festival was happening at this time. So this was all just like last minute, right? So the negatives are that I uh, delayed. I've been sort of in a bit of a holding pattern in terms of my Irish stuff for two years. The positives are I have been able to do a lot of shows in New York uh, since April. And as it turns out, during the pandemic, I met somebody and now we're engaged. So that probably wouldn't happen if the pandemic didn't happen. So that, 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 that was something that completely out of the blue happened that first summer of the pandemic, but she's from, she's a New Yorker. So who knows how that's going to screw up my future of, of my bi-coastal life. But she actually just went, she was just in Ireland with me for this quick two week trip right before Omicron really started to kick in uh, right before they started freaking out about that. Uh, she went to Ireland and she quite likes Ireland. So for the short term, I'm still going to be able to keep up my back coastal life because she actually quite likes spending time there. And she's also a comic. She does a lot of live stuff, but 
she being she's a little younger than me and she's just more like on she, her online stuff is more important so actually she can travel and continue to do uh the main things of her career uh without any great disruption you guys just could couldn't resist the romance of a worldwide play could you <laughs> Yeah, well, there's many jokes that my friends made about the fact that it took a pandemic to get me to settle down. But anyway, it, 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 that would, uh, I think it was by chance, but who the hell knows? <laughs> you mentioned a bi-coastal life, but that in, in some ways that simplifies things because you, you, your, your interest in your wanderlust, your interest in the world, your other cultures, call it what you will, it transcends Ireland and America. You, you, you've, you've immersed yourself in Chinese culture, uh, correct? Yep. What do you what do you attribute that to? I mean, um, to talk about that a little bit, um, that's that's a it's one thing for a, a person, you know, once a year to take a two week trip here and a two week trip there. It, it, you, you've you've learned the Irish language. You've you've immersed yourself in, in immerse yourself in other cultures. What, what do you attribute that to? I mean, a lot of it, a lot of it was just like a natural evolution, a little bit of luck, uh, because in those early series that I did in Ireland, a work experience and join a hood, there was an element of immersing myself in a situation. But, but the work experience, the, the thing that I did about living on minimum wage was an idea that was pitched to me and the way to do it was pitched to me. It just, it turned out that I was quite good in this immersion situation and so then I just embraced that that was like a, like a, I, I don't know if a format's the right word, but just like a way of doing things that, that uh, suited me and also made like good TV. It was very entertaining and also like a, a great way to like uh, really learn and, and also give you like a little, little bit of authority about what you were talking about because you're having like a real experience. So that there was, a, there was a little bit of like luck, like that, that, that way sort of fell into my lap. And then uh, particularly with the Irish language thing, you know, I had this interest in the Irish language because I didn't have to learn it when I was in school. Then like absorbing a culture and absorbing the language and uh, learning the culture through the language became like another thing that it turned out I was good at, which I didn't know. And so then I expanded it out to my uh, desire to learn Chinese. But even that was a little bit related to the luck of the first series because relationships I made with Chinese, you know, migrant workers that were living in Ireland during the Celtic Tiger, Relationships I made with them really was the foundation for why I became so interested in China. I had gone to visit them when they were on a vacation in China. And that's when I was like fascinated by China as the country and Chinese as the language I was already fascinated by because flushing, flushing in my lifetime completely changed to a Chinese neighborhood. Like I watched that happen and I watched my neighbors all become Chinese and I became friendly with them, but some of them literally couldn't speak English. I couldn't communicate. So I was like, I said dying to learn Chinese, just like a personal fascination. So all that stuff just came together. So part of it was luck. Part of it was just the nature of, of my life. And, uh, and also, I think because I was 14, I moved to Ireland and I had to assimilate, right? I think I just got quite good at like being in other lives and fitting in. I mean, I literally called one of my shows fitting in, but it, 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 it was also a theme uh, through my life was that like, I was pretty good at fitting into other cultures and I continue to use that for, you know, ways to tell stories and to entertain people. This is a terrible question to ask at a time when the world is sort of clamped down and has been for a long time, but for someone like you, who, who has sort of, uh, who have, who has set out to sort of learn about these things, do this kind of traveling, is there a project down the road near or far? that's a, a, another bit of a radical departure, but something you'd like to do quite different from, from what you've already done? I mean, right now, no, like right now, I don't, I don't have one. I, I had, I had tried to do the Arabic version of these like language projects, but it, I couldn't get it off the ground. So, uh, you know, for now, I, you know, for me personally, like my, my goal for like the, the next sort of short term major project, quote unquote, in my mind is to really, once Mia Mama is done, is to really focus on like writing a, a stand-up hour that would basically knock the socks off an American audience and just 100% commit to doing like a, like a comedy special that, you know, is 
you know, like a like a 10 out of 10 standard for the United States. So uh, once me and mom is done, I'm definitely going to, you know, throw down like touring around the States and really like just a hundred percent absorbing like a ripping show for, for over here. That's like my, the next uh, project in my mind. Cause you know, these, these immersion projects, I do love doing them, but they get harder when, you know, you're, you know, if, if you're, I'm getting married in May. So like, you know, when you're married and somebody else is involved, it's hard to fuck off for a year. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's hard to, it's hard to disappear in the ways that I have done in the past. You talk about, you know, a comedy special doing comedy, obviously that, that, that's one of the, the things that that's close to you. I don't need to tell you there's a sort of division in the country right now in America um, that, that's a, that has affected all levels of entertainment, including comedy that, you know, whether it's a joke you can or can't say or should or shouldn't say, or maybe you'll say one joke to one audience, not to another one. Um, have you noticed that or how has that, has that influenced or affected you, uh, your career? And is it different in Ireland and in the United States? I mean, it's definitely different in Ireland because they're not as divided, you know what I mean? And, and, uh, so, but on the flip side, you know, you, you can play with the division. So, you know, like you, 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 you know, if you do jokes about like how divided America is and I, they, they might not uh, connect with it as much, but that's a fun thing to, that's a fun thing to joke about. I mean, the whole thing about what you can and can't say, you know, it's, it's really a double-edged sword because, uh, you know, with the division and the oddness of, of America right now, uh, it, it, it's very easy to, to talk about that and to engage people, uh, it gets, gets people's goats up. You know, it's like a, it's kind of like not the worst thing for a comedian. The cancel culture stuff, it's real. You, of course, you have these things in your mind, you know, that things could be taken out of context. It's not about things that are, that are genuinely problematic, but, you know, it is, it, there is always a fear that something's going to be taken out of context. And possibly these days, the, uh, the fallout from that is, uh, you know, exaggerated in terms of like what, what should really happen. It's not that big of a deal. It's turned into a big deal. That's a little unfortunate, you know, uh, on the flip side, it's, you know, it's like, uh, maybe not as much of an issue as, as people think, but, but when it is an issue, it is, it is more of an issue than people think for the individual, you know what I mean? But yeah. in terms of the industry as a whole, most people are just getting on with it. And then, I guess you have to take the hits when that stuff, you know, pumps up. It's not as much of an issue in Ireland just because Ireland is, it's just not as hot with that stuff. You know what I mean? Like there's not as much heat around the, around the issues. Um, you know, I do also think that there's been quite a lot of pushback from society on, you know, whether full blown cancel culture stuff has been good for society. You know, and I, I think we'll naturally find a bit more of a healthy division between what's considered sort of like healthy activism, uh, you know, healthy ways to challenge the status quo and also what has clearly become like an abuse of power or an outrage industry, you know, all, all the stuff that goes with it. I, I'll be happy, I have to say, when that division becomes clearer and actually the people who are just literally trying to uh, better their own position <laughs> by, by quote unquote canceling, when that becomes clearer that that's going on, I, I think the, the, the world debate will be in a healthier place. I do think that that's happening already. So if we were having this conversation two years ago, I'd probably be a little more despondent about all that stuff. But I have felt that people are getting a little more, uh, they're getting a little more astute at finding out what's kind of like valid uh, challenges of what people are saying and what is clearly uh, opportunism, you know? And that's why I'm always cautious with the cancel culture stuff and what you can and can't say, because for every annoying cancel culture thing that they're complaining about on Fox, there is some, some, some good stuff that's happened, but for everybody who tries to dismiss people who complain about cancel culture, I think they're just as much in denial about the negative side of it, you know? So that's why you gotta be like, well, I, I'm cautious about it, but I definitely understand both sides. And I have seen firsthand uh, the positives and the negatives of it. And uh, 
you know, it, you, you, you'll be happy when some of these people who are literally chasing clout get their comeuppance because they've done pretty well out of it. <laughs> uh, we are about out of time. We've been talking to Des Bishop. I do have one more question for you. It's, it's somewhat inevitable. We've had to deal with this COVID thing for two years. You, you say you've met someone, you, you're getting married, and, and that's obviously a big chunk of sort of emotional, intellectual time. Uh, you, you've had some projects on hold. What else has this, what other deep thoughts has this put into your head? Have you learned something about yourself, other people, you know, your, your generation's place in history? What kind of deep thoughts has this coronavirus put <laughs> into your head? Well, one thing that coronavirus has put into my head is that all these disaster movies and zombie things like The Walking Dead, or basically anytime society hits a crisis, uh, everyone turns on each other in these. And I, I would have always thought that it was far fetched, but <laughs> after two years of the coronavirus and January 6th, I was like, wow, it turns out that they were right. <laughs> these guys must have a crystal ball or something. <laughs> the, the, the one thing I've learned about humanity, not a personal thing, but one thing I've learned about humanity is that, you know, actually there will, there will be divisions, you know, like even the Lord of the Flies, like in the end, there will not be a consensus on how to get through this crisis and people will get divided. And, uh, you know, that, 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 that's good to know for future crises. It's good to know that uh, consensus is going to be hard to find. Personally, for me, uh, I mean, the first year I was into the, the break, actually, the first year I was into just like taking some time, you know, you're getting up on stage literally every night since 19, well, not every night, but like you're getting on stage like 75% of the year since 1997, it's a lot of adrenaline, a lot of fight or flight, a lot of uh, cortisol, you know what I mean? Like a lot of stress hormones. So I, I think my body and my brain were happy with the actual, like a, an enforced break. So it was good for me to actually step back and realize how much stress and also like how much emotional reliance I have on the ups and downs of a comedy career. So that was actually, that was a positive, you know? Uh, after a year though, I was kind of done. And funnily enough, getting back into comedy, it, it helped me to actually really appreciate how much I love what I do and particularly the live part of it. So it did give me a renewed uh, appreciation and love for, for my job. Uh, by the way, it did also help to have a year off which was only literally a year after my mom died. So it was nice to be forced to actually like grieve properly because writing a show about your mother and getting it up on stage well within a year of her dying, like well before a year of her dying, uh, it might be perceived by people as a way to deal with your grief, but it's probably like parts of that weren't even the healthiest, I'd say, you know? So it was actually good to be forced to stop that for my own personal kind of like... Uh, emotional well-being and actually was forced to grieve you know I never even really grieved properly for my dad in the sense that like I was just going because I was literally in the middle of a show about him when he died because I, I wrote a show about him while he was living and got him involved in it so and then I was continuing to do that show after he died so in this situation it was probably good to be able to just actually sit back and just feel it which is interesting now getting back and doing the show uh it's it, I, I, when I do it now, I think what, like how the, I don't know how I did this with the rawness of it all. <laughs> I have a bit more of a detachment from now and I still find it tough. So I don't know how the hell I was doing it straight away after my mom died. Well, if you want to see what uh, Des Bishop came up with about, uh, about his mom, about motherhood, about parenthood and all that stuff, he is taking part in the 2022 Origin First Irish Fest uh, this month. There are shows in Queens and Manhattan. Go to origintheater.org for more information. Uh, this is Irish America Magazine. I'm Tom Degnan. Des, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, thanks. Nice to chat to you.